Hello, everyone, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards. As you, as you may have noticed, uh, starting in 2025, I've changed the cadence to Software Architecture Monday to occur monthly on the first Monday of each month. As a matter of fact, uh, today's lesson is Lesson 203, Understanding Architecture Style Risks Based on Our Star Rating Charts. When Neil Ford and I wrote the Fundamentals of Software Architecture book, oh, we created star ratings for each architecture style based on various architectural characteristics. And you can get this chart from my website by going into the Resources tab or menu item on developer2architect.com. Uh, One of the things which I'm going to show you in this lesson is we didn't mean for these star ratings to be restrictive in terms of, well, if we need this and it doesn't support it, we can't use it. Certainly, certain things can only be solved by architecture, things like elasticity and fault tolerance. However, I did get a couple of questions over the past couple of months that I wanted to show you as a way of kind of interpreting some of these star ratings. Uh, the first question I received uh, was this, or that was posed to me. Um, based on your star ratings chart, can we use microservices for a new high-performance system we are building? Or, based on your star ratings of two stars, are we forced to choose a different architecture style? And another question that was posed to me last month. We see from your chart that microservices is the most expensive architecture we could choose. Is it always so expensive, or are there ways we can mitigate that cost to make it less expensive so that it fits in our budget? So these are two really good examples, questions that were posed to me that made me think about a different way of interpreting these star ratings. So the original purpose of these star ratings was really to say, does the architectural style lend itself towards these architectural characteristics. Because there's certainly ways of making certain architecture styles performant or not performant. But there's another way I thought of to interpret these star ratings. And that is, when choosing an architectural style, you can leverage these star ratings to determine where the likely risk is within that architectural style choice. And that's what I wanted to show you in this lesson. Uh, let's go back to those questions that were posed to me um, by, uh, by clients uh, in the past couple of months. So based on your star ratings, can we use microservices for a high performance system? Because you're showing it two stars. Well, let's actually take a look at why we actually rated this two stars. The bottom line is that it all has to do with latency due to inter-service communication. When we make a request to a service, uh, that service goes and retrieves data from its own database within its bounded context, but then commonly has to go to other services to get further data. And those services retrieve data, they may do some processing, return that information back to the calling service, and this chain happens quite some time, and then finally returns the result of that processing or request to the user. Well, two services aren't overly bad, but we've got three kinds of latency involved with even just these two services. The first is network latency, the most common kind of latency we've, we see. Uh, this could range anywhere from 60 to 300 plus milliseconds. But we also have another kind of latency, and that is security latency, uh, to protect those endpoints that we're calling. And the third is that hidden one that I call data latency. Because for a single request, we're making multiple database calls now. And all those times start adding up. And it starts to add up when, in fact, we start calling multiple services. So this kind of architecture would certainly perform extremely well. This will not. And unfortunately, when we use single-purpose services, they're typically fine-grained, 
And consequently, we do typically have a lot of inner service communication, which tends to slow down microservices. So rather than saying, oh, we can't use it, let's take a look at this as risk. And how can we mitigate the risk if we have a scenario where we do have a lot of inner service communication? The first way to mitigate that risk is to adjust your granularity. Many times, all those inner service calls are a result of the fact that we went too far across the line in terms of that fine-grained single-purpose service. And because our functionality is highly semantically coupled, bringing all that functionality together in a single deployment unit, a single service, removes all of that latency, therefore speeding up our microservices ecosystem. Another technique we can use is to share data, particularly if all those inner service calls, or most of them, are to retrieve data I don't own because it's not in my bounded context. And in which case we still have a bounded context, but it happens to be a broader bounded context. Uh, from an infrastructure standpoint, we can sometimes solve this problem uh, through what's called co-service location. Now, this means services that communicate with each other constantly are put in the same uh, Kubernetes pod or the same virtual machine. Therefore, all of those calls now become local calls. They're still remote, but we're transferring 60 to 300 milliseconds into something that's 1 to 2 milliseconds. And this can significantly increase responsiveness. However, there's a cautionary tale to all of these risk mitigation factors. And because co-service location will typically impact things like fault tolerance, uh, scalability, elasticity, and those sort of operational characteristics. Well, another technique we can leverage is, especially if we're calling services to retrieve data is to use in-memory replicated caching. Uh, tools, for example, like Apache Ignite, uh, Coherence, uh, Hazelcast, Gemfire, Infinispan. These are the kind of tools that leverage in-memory replicated caching. And therefore, removing all of that latency for having to retrieve your data. So that's just kind of an example of saying you can, you can still use it, um, microservices, but there's risk associated with it and ways to mitigate that risk. But what about cost? Because this question came up last month that was posed to me about, is it always expensive? Where does that cost come from? Well, instead of just saying it's too expensive, what we can do is analyze where that expensive cost comes from. And in microservices, it typically comes from the size of the system. Small systems will be fairly cheap, but larger ecosystems start rising exponentially in cost. A lot of that has to do with some of the licensing costs associated uh, with any kind of services, third-party services, or data. Um, development skill set and experience is particularly important within microservices because it is a complex architecture. And as a matter of fact, speaking of a complex architecture. Also, the complexity of the business problem perhaps influences microservices more than other architecture styles because it is also a complex architecture. And if we combine a complex architecture with a complex business problem, it's probably going to take longer, hence cost more. Also, the anticipated rate of change after that initial development will influence the microservices architecture cost, as well as or any organizational change needed, breaking apart data, um, modifying your existing deployment pipeline. But one of the other things that we can do to mitigate that cost is to consider those hybrid architecture possibilities that not everything has to be microservices in our system. And forming hybrids with something like service-based architecture uh, would significantly reduce the cost associated with microservices. Uh, there's one other example I wanted to show you, and that was we, we've kind of been focusing on 
one extreme end, microservices. But what about monoliths? They have risk as well. Because we notice that with the layered and the modular monolith, they're not very agile. Um, it doesn't lend itself towards, these two architecture styles don't lend themselves towards maintainability, testability, and deployability. Does that mean that we can't use them if we're facing constant change? Of course not. What it means is that's our risk area. And when we look at mitigating that risk, we focus on simple, small, well-structured monoliths. And we combine that kind of characteristic with proper engineering practices and some tight governance using automated fitness functions. And these kind of techniques can then help mitigate that kind of risk. So because you see only one or two, maybe even three stars in an architectural style that you would like to use, what it means is that you're likely to incur risk in that area. And that's the area to focus on where we could possibly mitigate that risk so that you can, in fact, use that architecture style. And so this has been Lesson 203, Understanding Architecture Style Risks. Uh, again, um, thank you so much for uh, listening and stay tuned in one month the first Monday of each month uh, for the next lesson in Software Architecture Monday.